How many prayers have been prayed for me? How many prayers have they prayed for you? I thank God that he answers each and every prayer that we speak. That we can have confidence that he's heard us and that he doesn't have to warm up. He doesn't have to get a few practice swings in. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being faithful to the house of God. I'm encouraged by the body of Christ that's here tonight on a Wednesday night. See, this, this life that we live committed to God goes beyond a, a day on the week, a calendar, a schedule, an event. It is literally our lives. You could say it's our livelihood. And it's, it's, it's good to be about our Father's business anytime the doors are open to gather ourselves together like we have here tonight. I just, you are an encouragement to me for being faithful to the house of God. Looking ahead, we are very excited about this Sunday. Um, of course, every Sunday morning, service at 10 a.m., um, God is going to do great things. And then we're going to stretch ourselves Sunday night to do something that we haven't done, at least not uh, like this before, uh, to have our Sunday night service in the park. Uh, the park down the road here at Franksville Park. Um, we sent some spies in to, to spy out the land to see what it was all about. And um, uh, it looks like there's going to be some opportunities to be a witness to our community and so uh, everyone needs to bring your own chair Sunday night. Uh, it's a little bit of a do-it-yourself mission. Um, we're going to sing some songs. We're going to worship the Lord. We're going to hear some incredible testimonies, and God is going to honor our steps of faith. And we're going to have a great time in fellowship. Uh, if you're not familiar with Franksville Park, it's the park that's right down the road. The address is on the flyers. And Franksville Park is quite large. Uh, there's a road that kind of weaves and winds through it. You go from one end to the other end. Um, this is on the far northwest end of the park, uh, closest to what is known as the Kids Connection. Uh, we have both shelters, one and two, reserved. I'm sure we'll probably be more centrally located or across one of those, but bring a chair, invite someone, grab a few flyers on your way out. Um, we're going to be the church outside these walls on Sunday night. Amen? Um, this Sunday morning, um, also asking it, all of our men that uh, have a desire to be a part of, part of our men's outbound adventure. We're looking for your fo forms and your uh, deposit to be uh, received this Sunday. Uh, you can see myself or Brother Smith um, to do that. And um, I mentioned before uh, the slight revision to the, the process. Uh, this is a refundable deposit because I understand that uh, for some uh, there may be a collaboration of equipment that has to take place in order for you to be certain uh, of your readiness. And so um, we're going to make sure. There's, there's already a number of people that have volunteered their gear, their camping equipment. So I believe that anybody who wants to go will be well covered. Tonight I'd like to pray a blessing on the, the tithes and the offering. And I'd like to uh, ask God's blessing on his word as well. But don't just listen to me speak those words. Ask God to bless the offering as well. Would you join me in that prayer right now? Jesus, we're here because of you. We're here for you, God. And we thank you for your, your promises, your goodness, your mercy, God. I, I pray your blessing on the tithes and the offering, God, for the faithfulness of your people, God, that you would rebuke the devourer, God, that you would give us a confidence in you and a trust that produces that contentment that your word speaks of, God. I pray your blessing on the word of God tonight as it goes forth. Let it accomplish your perfect will. I ask it all in your name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. I appreciate the opportunity Sunday night that uh, you allowed us to, to not be here, my wife and I, as we went to minister at the church in West Dallas at Cornerstone Apostolic Church. Um, it was, a, it was a, an experience and a blessing for both myself and my wife and I, I pray the congregation there was blessed as well. And in fact, a, a few uh, old friends, old faces 
uh, my wife knew from very young in her life were there, and um, there was a definite affirmation of God's spirit, much like I heard took place here on Sunday night as uh, Brother Meyer did just an incredible job ministering in the spirit. Um, God knows how to put a thing together. He knows, he has precision, he, he knows dates, he knows times, and even when we think we just stumbled into it, it, it we, we didn't. The Bible says that the footsteps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, and that, what does that mean? It means when we're in alignment with him, when we are walking in the spirit, when we are stepping in obedience to the word of God, just in our everyday lives, no matter where we are, whether we're at the store, at work, or at home, we can take confidence that we are in the perfect will of God and that whatever happens, God is well aware and it is his will, even when it's not exactly what we thought should happen. Tonight I want to continue to build on the message that I shared in part on Sunday morning to go a little further down the path of practical ways in which we can find the kind of contentment and peace and joy that is determined not by the situations or the seasons in life we face, but in our confidence in God and his word, and, and not just a theoretical confidence, but an actual, the anointing, the, the power and the presence of God that moves in our lives. And so if you'd stand with me tonight, and if you turn in your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 8. This is in part the rest of the message that I did not get to share with you on Sunday morning. Reading from Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. It says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, there's just even just a shred of something valuable, something praiseworthy. Think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace shall be with you. Why does it matter what we think on? What we allow into our minds, what we entertain, what we contemplate? Well, Proverbs Chapter 23 and 7 answers that question. The answer, the question of why is it important? For as he thinketh in his heart, as we contemplate, as we consider, as we form strategies and actions and follow out our intent, as we think, as a man, as a woman thinketh in his heart, so is he, so are they. You've heard the saying, you are what you eat. According to the scriptures, you are what you think. Could we, one more time, would you, would you pray? Would you ask God to speak to us here tonight? Would you call on his name? Lord, there is nothing without you, God. We need you in everything, God. We are in it, unable to, to do and to be all that you've called us to be, except you be in it, except your spirit give us the power and your word give us that foundation to stand on, God. We ask that you would anoint your word tonight, that you would accomplish your will. In your name, Jesus, we ask it. Amen. You may be seated again tonight. Thank you for standing for in honor of the word of God. If you were here Sunday morning, we talked briefly about some of our earliest childhood memories and, and specifically as they related to trust, right? As a child, we just, we believe everything we hear and we trust everyone and then there's some point in life where we, we stop believing everything and we stop trusting everything. And as I started to, to further contemplate this childhood memories, have you ever tried to challenge yourself how far back in your own mind you can go? in your own timeline, right? We know that, um, you know, as, a, as, a, as the a youngest child, right, there isn't really a likelihood that you can remember coming out of your mother's womb. Thank God. But somewhere down the road, a few years add up, and, and we start to be able to have the ability to remember things. 
And I'm not sure where that is. It may be a little different for individuals. When I think of myself, when I try to go back in my own mind to those earliest memories, I think sometimes I actually uh, cheat my own brain and I go back to the, the pictures that I see in the photo albums that are in my mo mother and father's house. That, you know, and, and so I'm actually going back to a much more recent memory as I remember seeing the picture of me and, and I start putting myself in places and sometimes those pictures, they kind of stir up some of those old memories as well, right? And so you can, you can start to, even as you flip through that uh, photo album, you'll be like, oh, I completely forgot about that, but now these memories come back. Of all of my memories, as a, a, the earliest memories that I can go back to in my mind, to the best of my ability, without counting on those pictures that are the things that actually are the more recent memory, one of those memories I have is of eating peanut butter and jelly Ritz crackers in our family room. Yeah, food continues to be an anchor point in my life. <laughs> Nothing's new. There's nothing new under the sun. And I remember as a very young child sitting in the, that same family room, and I rem another memory, and I don't, I don't think it went with the peanut butter and jelly crackers, because I don't, I'm sure my mom wouldn't just allow me to have freedom with that, but I remember in that same setting, in that same room, uh, there was these cabinets. In fact, they were there even into my own children's childhood as they went and visited my mom. That's where the toys and books were in these cabinets, and that's where my toys and books were because the toys and books that my kids played with were mine, still, you know, in their sacred place in the home that I grew up in. And, and I remember from a very young age, again, they, these are, I go to these memories because there isn't a picture of them per se. So I know they're real. I know they're from me and not from some other source. I remember um, pulling books out, in fact, dumping books out of that cabinet, and, the, and above the cabinet was a fish tank, and um, my father would take us on trips to uh, Jim's Aquarium in Kenosha, where we would uh, find a new fish to put in our tank until it, you know, expired and it went down the toilet. And this, these are some of my earliest memories. And if, I, if you asked me what books were in that cabinet, I, could, I couldn't tell you about any of them except one. There's one book that, that stood out that, that has somehow been set apart from all of my other childhood books. And in fact, the, the words of the book have stuck with me even. It's a book entitled, The Little Engine That Could. Some of you are familiar with that story. For those of you who are not, let me fill you in. It's about a, a circus train filled with toys and food and treats, things that all little boys and girls would like, and it's on its way to its destination, but it's, it can't get there because the train that was pulling it has given up the ghost. It's just stopped working entirely, and the book doesn't give much hope for the train that stopped, and so as the, the clowns and the, the animals and the things that are on the circus train are waiting for a way to get to the children who want to have time with them and enjoy them, there's another engine that comes by, and the engine, first engine that comes by is, um, while it's able to do the job to get the train to where it needs to go over the mountain, it, it has some very important work to do, and it's too important to take the time to help this silly circus train, and, and so that train passes them by, and then there's a second train that comes and is even more capable to take the circus train cars across over the mountain to where the children are, but that train's got really important things to do, and so that train passes them by, and then there's this third train that comes that the little blue engine that's not nearly as strong as the first or the second, and this little blue train, in fact, admits in the book it's never even been over that mountain pass. It doesn't know what's on the other side. It doesn't even know if it itself could make it over the mountain, but that little engine that could does exactly what the Bible says we ought to do, to think on these things. This little blue engine in its book said over and over, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. You know what? Why don't we all say that right now together? I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Did you just feel the power of 
thinking on these things start to happen right there? There was a moment of possibility that opened up, like Philippians 4 and 8 says, that whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, things that are pure, things that are lovely, things that are of a good report, if there be any virtue, think on these things. There's a power that God has delegated to his creation to perform a good work within ourselves when we take steps of obedience to actually do what the scriptures instruct us to do like we just did a moment ago. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. There's a power when we start to think thoughts that are pointed in the right direction. They have virtue or some praise or some some value to them. Here tonight, as, as we even just repeated that, and, and there was a, just a little bit of spark of hope, of some possibility, I don't even know what we were thinking we could do. Right? We, we're just kind of making this blanket statement, I think I can. It, our thoughts don't even have to have a, a, a necessary target or an end state to produce the peace of God that shall be with you when we think on those things. Alternatively, if we think on the things that are on the opposite end of that spectrum, it stands to reason that the the God of peace will be with someone else, perhaps not ourselves. See, we can convince ourselves of just about anything. That's a gift and a curse. And unfortunately, too often, we, we do just that. In fact, we We convince ourselves of things, thinking thoughts, and over and over we think these thoughts, and some of those thoughts are pointed in the wrong direction. They're they're often not true. And so therefore, they're they're not honest either. We're, We're not even honest with ourselves. We convince ourselves of all sorts of things that aren't true about ourselves. For example, if we've struggled with some sin of disobedience in our lives, we may start to think to ourselves, I'll always struggle with this. I'll never get the victory. There's no way that God can forgive me. False, not true, not a good report. Don't think of those things. Not only do they go against the scripture that we read in our opening text, they, are, they, they go against the word of God. If you turn your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 36, Here's some words that we can encourage ourselves with that are true, that are of a good report, that are worthy of praise. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 36. The Bible says that we're more than conquerors. Think on these things. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. Had a bad day? It happens. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. But even in a bad day, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Think on these things. It's in the same portion of Scripture in Romans chapter 8, verse 31 proclaims, What shall we then say to these things, if God be for us, who can be against us? These are confidence-building scriptures. God is for us, and so therefore the answer is no one can be against us. No thing can come against us. Romans 8 and 33, the same chapter says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? No one. It's God that justifieth. In that same chapter of Romans 8, verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? No one shall separate us from the love of Christ. No situation, no persecution, no famine, no nakedness, no peril, no sword. No, not nothing. But at times we can convince ourselves, I've gone too far, I've done too much, I I haven't done what I should have, I did what I shouldn't have. Whatever it was, don't convince yourself of a mistruth, a false truth, a you know what, I think right now might be another good time to practice that saying that the little engine had. What was it again? I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. All right, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting a little bit of life back in, 
So I think I can. Can I tell you as a witness of the power of the Holy Ghost within us, it's more than just the power of positive thinking. That's not what we're relying on, but there is a power in thought and there's a power in word. We're more than conquerors because they're because of God's Spirit that's doing that good work within us, every time we take a very simple step of obedience, when we actually apply the instructions, even the simplest of instructions, like we're reading here tonight, to just think on these things. Oh no, there's something, there's something bigger, more important that God wants me to do. No, he, he wants you to think on these things. Really, is that all it takes? Yes, because... The real battle isn't a physical battle. It's not some mountain that we actually have to climb up and conquer. The real battle is all up here in our minds, in the gray matter between our ears. The real battle is a spiritual battle. I said before in a message a few weeks ago that we are made much more up of spirit than we give ourselves credit for. The breath of life our awareness, our consciousness, the ability to think, to see, to feel, to be. It's because God's Spirit breathed the breath of life into us that gives us that ability, that consciousness, that awareness. And thoughts in our minds are not a physical thing, right? You can, you can take action on a thought and it become a physical thing, but the thought itself is not a physical thing. It is a spiritual thing. Think on these things, and the God of peace that passes all understanding will keep your mind and your soul stayed on him. He'll keep you in a place where your feelings won't so easily betray you, where your thoughts won't continually lead you down into a place that you don't want to be. Here's what we just read in Romans chapter 8 that's speaking to the battlefield that is our minds, that is our thoughts, because the context for being more than conquerors is all about waging the war in our minds. The context for invoking if God be for us, who can be against us is about addressing the bombs that get dropped into our thoughts. The context for repeating to ourselves that no one and nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ is to fight back the thoughts of condemnation. This, these are all in context of the battle that's going on between our ears. I'm not stretching it. Let's read it together. Let me prove it to you here. And if you turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8 now in verse 1, this is the same portion of Scripture we've been reading. Romans 8 and 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Let me ask you, what is condemnation except a feeling? A feeling of guilt. The word itself is defined as thoughts of anticipation for an adverse sentence in judgment, condemnation. If we continue to read in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Again, the the spirit, the breath of God, the life that we have, the consciousness, it's all up here in our minds. That's where it transacts. For they that after the flesh do mind or exercise thoughts about the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit do exercise thoughts about the things of the spirit. We're talking about the mind, thoughts, the intent. For to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Verse 6 and 7 here in the Word of God, is, as it references carnality, is not talking about physical manifestations of carnal actions. It's speaking to the thought that takes place in the mind. To be carnally minded is death. To be to have a carnal mind is the enemy or enmity of God. What the law could not do, it could not do because acts of obedience under the law all took place in a physical realm. There was a, a physical sacrifice that 
was made. But even with the blood of innocent animals that was shed, those people under law did not actually have a freedom that we have in the Spirit, that we have under grace, under God's mercy. The law could not address the real issue because the real issue is not in the physical realm, it's on the carnal realm, it's in the realm of the Spirit. The realm of thoughts, the realm of intent, the realm of feelings, things that aren't physical. What was it that that little engine said? I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. You know what? I think you can too. And the Word of God agrees that through the Spirit of God working in us, we can actually be victorious. We can overcome our sinful nature. We can be transformed into his likeness. I think I can. Galatians 5, if you turn your Bibles, if you have them, turn with me, if you would, to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Here we have a similar, similar comparison between the th thoughts that are of a virtuous nature versus thoughts that are of a carnal or fleshly nature. Galatians chapter 5 and 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. This is an incredible promise of God, the promise that His Spirit always works. When we exercise it, when we walk in obedience to the Word of God, there will be an overcoming power that we mature and grow into. If you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led by the spirit, you're not under the law. When our thoughts are not thinking on these things, like we read in our opening text, like the Bible says, and gives us very simple instructions to just think on these things, things, things that are of a good report, things that are true, things that are honest, if we don't think on these things, then you cannot do the things that you would or that you should do or that you know of because an unchecked mind is enmity against God. Unchecked thoughts are the opposing force of the spiritual force of God in us, his spirit in us. But if we take steps through thoughts, through our own decision-making process, to put into subjection our thoughts to the word of God, if we'll take our minds and think on these things, there's a promise that through that action of thinking, not doing even, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh because every sinful or wrong act started with a thought. Long before it was manifested in the physical world, there was a, an intent, a feeling. Let me ask you this, when, when a preacher says, well, you just got to walk in the Spirit, what does that mean? Really, what does is, what is walking in the Spirit mean? When it says, this I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, if you take a very literal, uh, wrong assumption, that it, you might say that if I'm just filled with the Holy Ghost and I'm walking from point A to point B, well, I must be walking in the Spirit because the Spirit of God is in me. No, that's not what it's saying, and I think that's pretty obvious. That's not the kind of walking, not the physical kind of walking. Yes, you, you have God in this vessel made of flesh when you're filled with the Spirit, with the evidence of speaking other tongues, as the Spirit gives the utterance, but the physical step from walking from here to there is not walking in the Spirit, although I could imagine where some may come up with that kind of definition. Now, the kind of walking that's described here is the kind of walking that speaks to a way of living, and which by implication requires a way of thinking that precedes the way of living. Because every action, good or bad, started somewhere as thoughts in our minds. In addition to the physical act of walking, the, the word that we read here as walk in the Greek means not only to take steps, but to live to be occupied with, to walk at large, especially as in proof of ability. Well, now that's starting to sound more like a, a life committed to Christ. And the word spirit here, when it says walk in the spirit, in addition to meaning the breath of God, which it certainly is pointing towards, it can also be defined, that same word can be defined as 
the rational soul or our consciousness. Or by implication, spirit can be defined as one, one's mental disposition or mind. See, we're much more spirit than we give ourselves credit for. There's, there's something going on inside of our, our brains that is far beyond the physical domain. Our opening text said, Think on these things, and the God of peace shall be with you. Here in Galatians chapter 5, we now understand that it's only when we live a life and take action to direct one's thoughts, when we live that or walk at large thinking on these things, that there will be proof of the ability as our actions will follow suit in line with our thoughts. Romans chapter 8 similarly told us that but they are after the Spirit do exercise the thoughts about the things of the Spirit for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. These are consequences for thinking on these things. For keeping our thoughts in check and not just letting them run wild. And therefore there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who take responsibility for their thoughts, redirecting ourselves to actually do the very sm simple, small things in life, to think on these things. Now, the Bible isn't suggesting that we you know, drop out of society and recite the scriptures to ourselves like a group of monks in a monastery or something like that to, you know, to, to perpetually think on these things. That's, that's not what it's implying, but it is suggesting, and in fact not suggesting, but directing us that in every aspect of our lives we can start to take action to redirect our thoughts in a direction that's of a good report, of some virtue, of, of any praise. If it's true, if it's honest, if it's just, if it's pure, if it's lovely, think on these things. Now I'm aware that to some degree this might feel like mission impossible to actually stop ourselves from having stinking thinking because at times it may seem like our minds think on things almost as if they're thinking about them on their own or thoughts come into our minds at times seemingly from, from nowhere and so I'm not unaware of the, the challenge that this can pose and to a degree I would agree that there's a certain level of control that we may not consciously always be able to invoke, to override, at least not 100% of the time, but there's a, a majority of the time in which we actually do play a role. And I would tell you that in part, even in those times where it seems like the thoughts are uncontrollable and, and somehow just happening to us, I would like to propose to you that those are in fact most likely well-worn paths within our minds, mindsets that we've solidified over time, even if we're unaware of it. Over the last several months, I've, I've just become very intrigued diving in and learning about the supercomputer that we have in our brain. It is, in fact, scientists, they can't fully explain how it works. Um, we have computers and we have um, processors and the ability to write code and programs that can mimic certain aspects of what a human can do, but even the best of the best of the artificial intelligence don't come close to being able to do what we do every day we, we breathe and live and do and be, everything is happening and there's signals that our brain is sending throughout our whole body, our whole nervous system is able to communicate in a blink, in an instant, in a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second. Did you know that there's over 86 billion neurons in your brain? Neurons are the nerve cells that send messages all over the body that allow you to do everything that you are doing right now, breathing, eating, walking, thinking. The neurons are firing right now as you hear the sound of my voice so that you can interpret those sounds and, and then neurons are processing those sounds to interpret the words and then put them together to comprehend. Like how? Do, as you turn the pages of your Bible, neurons are firing t for your motor actions and as you read the words of the scripture again while this is a very very overly simplistic explanation your brain's electrical system when it fires these messages it, they fire from one neuron into what's called the synaptic gap until that signal hits another neuron again 86 billion neurons so there's a lot of neurons potentially to hit 
And so your brain is always on ready to fire because it doesn't know when it may be called on to perform whatever is that part of that function that it, the brain does. And so to always be ready, that neuron has to have within itself a, a certain amount of energy that's ready to be leveraged. And so again, this is a very oversimplified explanation, but your brain consumes 20% of all the energy that your body produces, while it represents only 2% of its weight. So above and beyond just your muscles and your lungs and all the, the motor functions that you have where you think, I'm sure, a, a portion of your energy is going, a, a very small portion of your body weight, your mass, your brain is using up a very large portion of your energy because it has to be ready to fire all of these 86 billion neurons. And so your brain is no dummy, unintended, at least not medically speaking. I mean, take a test, you'll have to tell yourself that. But knowing how much energy your brain is constantly using, your brain is always trying to optimize because it's a high-consuming part of our, our, our bodies. And so our brain will send those signals on the path of least resistance because that makes the most sense. We all do things on whichever way will accomplish that goal that's the path of least resistance. And when our thoughts, when they start to betray us, when we start to have these thoughts come to us, maybe that, that, that seemingly come from places unknown, or we start to then think them again and again, we, we actually start to create well-worn paths, scientists say, and, and they, that path then becomes the path of least resistance, and our brain being so smart, by default trying to optimize its energy, will always then, given the opportunity, go to that path of least resistance, and this phenomenon, while it's not still fully understood, the neural pathways and the neuroplasticity may be in part the explanation why over time, we can't seem to escape certain thoughts or certain ways of thinking. And of course, Proverbs 23 and 7 would affirm that. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. We thought a thought was just an electrical charge, but an electrical charge can carve out a path and it can become part of us to a degree. The good news is, medically speaking, those same pathways that have become the paths of least resistance, that have resulted in the opposite of thinking about the things that are good, because we, we thought too many times about the things that weren't good, those same paths can be rerouted and reshaped in the pathways that produce things that have virtue and praise. We can rebuild those paths of least resistance to flow in places that are of a good report and of a, of a good nature. You know what, I think we could do that again right here. What did that little engine say? I think I can, I, I think I can, I think I can. Let's do it again, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. I feel hope rising in this place. As children of God, we have been redeemed by his blood and his spirit, but we have been instructed by his word to take an active role, to shape our thoughts, to create new patterns that are after Christ. Yeah, God has given us the power to overcome, but we have to exercise it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, the Bible says that we are to bring into captivity every thought. If you have your Bibles, if you turn with me there, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, for, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, See, it's not about the physical world. It's about the spiritual world. There's a spirit of man. There's a spirit of Christ. God engrafts his spirit into our spirit so that we can become like him. It's a spiritual transaction. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh because that's not where the war is. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Where are the strongholds? Casting down imaginations and every high thing in our minds that exalted itself against the knowledge of God 
There's no way God can forgive me. I'll never be used of God again. These are thoughts of strongholds in our minds that go against every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And when we have those kind of thoughts that are contrary to the word of God or that are not of a good report or of a good nature, if they aren't true, we are instructed to take an active role to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Romans chapter 12 and 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Tonight as the musicians come, God is speaking to someone who may be struggling with their thoughts. And that's all of us at some level. None of us are exempt from the battle that is going on in our minds. But now here, building on our message from Sunday morning, when we shared that whatsoever state, everywhere and in all things, we're instructed to be content, to find a peace that passes all understanding because we know that God is the God of everything, not just the good things, not just the bad things, but everything which will require every person to then bring their thoughts into the captivity of Christ. God, I really don't like the way this is going. My life is a mess, God. I, I can't seem to get it, uh, get it right. I, God, I keep failing. I fail you, I fail me, I fail everybody. Those kind of thoughts can become the path of least resistance in our minds, and next you know we don't know how to get away from them. When the word of God is saying, number one, none of those things you just said are true. Number two, here's what you need to do. Think on these things. Take an active role. Don't just lay down and take another beating from yourself, from your mind, from your thoughts. Every one of us needs to bring our thoughts into the captivity of Christ because if those thoughts are left unchecked, they do start to accumulate, and maybe you're already there. And when they accumulate, it does become the pattern that seems impossible, if not very, very difficult to break. And it robs us of the joy of the Lord that maybe we once had, stuck in a pattern of thinking that only seems to produce more of the same, and, and it's true. But it's also true on the opposite end of the spectrum. The more we think on these things, things that are good, things that are true, things that are honest, things that are worthy of praise, well, then that will produce in of itself more of the same. If you turn in your Bibles with me to our last scripture in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17. It's speaking to the battle that is going place, going on right now in our minds. Thoughts that enter in. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth not walk as other Gentiles walk. How do they live their life? In the vanity of their mind. Can I tell you this world is filled with mechanisms to engage your mind to fill it with all sorts of fantasies and ideas and it's not all bad but it's not all good don't walk as the other Gentiles walk allowing their thoughts to go unchecked in the vanity of their mind and having under, their understanding darkened because of it being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, their emotions, their thoughts, their intents, continue to lead them down the path that wasn't a good path. Who being past feeling, having given themselves over unto lasciviousness or unbridled lust, to work all in cleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him, if you've heard of Jesus Christ, if you've been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, then 
Put off the former conversations, the old thoughts, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind because we are far more spiritual than we give ourselves credit for. And those thoughts are producing a spiritual outcome. And there will be evidence for or against. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man taking an active role to step into think on these things carving out new pathway, pathways which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness wherefore put away all lying speak every man truth with his neighbor think on these things things that are true things that are honest as a child of God, every one of us needs to actively work to identify those thoughts that perhaps have formed patterns that influence our lives, and especially if they are contrary to the Word of God. And every time that thought tries to enter in, every time we tell ourselves that thing about ourselves that isn't true, we need to take that thought and think a thought to counter it. To think on these things. Would you stand with me tonight? You know, one more time, what did the little engine that could say? I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. As we open up this altar, there might be a few more words that you would like to express to yourself and to God about what you think. Would you come tonight? The altar's open.